today's uh, session number five or lesson number five, the heart of servanthood. Uh, this is something that's uh, very important. It's going to be a fun lesson. But if I can also uh, portray it in a different format, that today's uh, lesson is going to be more of like an open heart surgery, metaphorically speaking, where we're going to allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to minister to us, and we're going to actually examine ourselves. Where is my heart? Uh, when it comes to heart, uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord and I began to read the Bible, I began to hear sermons, and I'm hearing the word heart, heart, I'm thinking, this thing inside of me that beats it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, what kind of heart is he talking about? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I'm like, my heart doesn't have a mouth. Okay, it's kind of, you know, circulating blood. It's, it's allowed my mouth to move. I did not understand that until obviously with the help of some uh, preachers, ministers, my father and others. Like, no, no, heart has a different role and purpose. So in a simplified form, our heart, when the Bible talks about our heart, it has to do with our character. It has to do with our personality. It has to do with our attitude. It has to do with our thought process. It has to do with our motives. That's, that's what part of the heart means. So as I gave that example just now, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is in your heart, both good, bad, evil, bad temper, whatever is stored in there, as soon as you open your mouth, it's going to come out, depending on the situation, depending what kind of conversation you're having. So uh, that's what we're going to focus on today, that what does it mean for me as a child of God to have the heart of servanthood. Not just, oh, I serve people. For example, we know when we go to restaurants, we have a waiter or waitress, usually, typically, they're serving us. If we're flying in an airplane, we have uh, stewards and stewardesses, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not saying that correctly. Also, they're you know overseeing, helping us out. So there's people who are even functioning in a job to serve us. We know that there's different businesses out there. Some businesses deal with product, and there's some businesses that deal with service. So if you're a customer and you have an issue with a specific product, there's usually a phone number, and when you're calling, you're gonna be calling who? <laughs> country, yeah. But it's typically called <laughs> customer service. Hello, my friend, how are you? Something like that. Yes, so you're calling customer service. So I am as a customer, I have a need, I have an issue, I have a problem. I, I want to go to a certain department store, I want to go to a certain place because I have an issue that needs to be resolved. So we're hoping because I invested my time and money into a specific product or service that this company, this business, this organization is going to actually help me out. So we understand all these basic fundamentals. So now the big question is, when it comes to the body of Christ, thank you, Pastor. When it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to us as a local church in this community, the big question we need to ask ourselves is, what kind of customer service is my local church or is the body of Christ providing to the world? And that a lot of times has to do with our heart and it has a lot of times to do with servanthood. In our Christian world or language, we don't call it customer service. We call it servanthood. And Jesus, as we open up uh, on the page 42, uh, he gives us the introduction to the sole concept of servanthood. And in Mark, we read 1045. This is Jesus talking. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for men. And that's what we're actually celebrating this week. So Jesus said, hey, when I came into this world, I didn't come out here, hey, the Son of God has arrived, okay, come on, worship me, you know what I mean? Serve me. He's like, no, 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 I came here for a purpose, so I can serve others, so I can offer that customer service to others, if I can use that term. So today we're going to be talking about the importance of servanthood. It has to do a lot with our hearts, and actually, in our previous last week's lesson, we concluded with the characteristic traits and qualities of, you know, godly love. Because love and heart, they, they come together like close friends and close uh, twins. So, what is the heart of servanthood? Can somebody help me read Proverbs 4.23? Thank you. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Interesting. Very powerful description that we read in Proverbs. So, what does that mean? Just as the heart is the most important member uh, in our physical body, so is the same towards leadership or even servanthood. 
So in today's uh, lesson, you're going to come across the word or the term leadership. And you're thinking, well, isn't this like school of discipleship? Well, why leadership? Shouldn't that be something else? So if I can simplify it for you, leadership is discipleship and discipleship is leadership. How so? Because Jesus is our ultimate leader or role model, as we talked about in previous session, I chose to follow after him. I want to be his disciple. But as I'm following and serving Jesus, I'm learning from him. I'm learning from him how to reach out to other people. And in return, now Jesus, like after I've equipped you, after you've received my word, my truth, now go out there and serve others. Because John Maxwell has one of the best definitions for leadership by saying that leadership is influence. So now... The word that I have inside of me, the life that I have inside of me, the revelation I have inside of me, now I'm trying to bring it out there so I can influence or impact other people. So that's why being a disciple of Jesus is also being a leader, someone who's doing something, someone who's bringing some kind of impact or some kind of change. Next point about the heart of servanthood is the heart of every leader or, or disciple contains who they are, their character, as I mentioned before, their passion, their attitude, their motives, and their nature, or even their true nature. Everything that's within them, it's going to come out, whether in a good way or in a bad way. Another point about the heart of servanthood is, it's an individual's, um, an individual's heart is frequently invisible in action and in words. So if I truly position myself to serve someone, it's going to be visible. We don't do it just by words. Words do have a certain meaning by saying, hey, I love you, I honor you, I respect you, that's good. But then a lot of times when we can back up what we're saying through action and deeds, that's where true servanthood comes in. Additionally, the one more point is there are more than 500 uh, verses in the Bible, and I think that comes from the New King James Version, uh, that relates to our heart, meaning to our inner character of who we are. And in two different translations, I purposely put that in here in Matthew 6, 21, so we can have a little bit of a broader perspective concerning the heart, and it's this, Matthew 6, 21 in New King James Version. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. But the New Living Translation puts it this way, which I also like. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart also be. And the question is for all of us, what is my treasure? Okay? What is my treasure? Where is my treasure? And as we go further, one of the most important questions that we all need to consider is, number one, where is my treasure in accordance to that scripture? And number two, who is my treasure? Where is my treasure? And who is my treasure? And in order to understand that, I kind of simplified it this way. Just, just a little thought to simplify it. Where defines my area of focus or work or ministry or, or something that gives me an inner passion to serve. Like most of us here, if I'm not mistaken, we're somehow to a certain degree involved in a local church. Question of where? Where are you involved? What are you currently doing right now for the Lord? That question of who defines the people on whom I must concentrate, a specific targeted audience. So uh, the other day we were getting together with the um, leaders of life groups, and that's a specific group of individuals that are focusing on something specific in our local church, which is life groups. Now, are life groups the only thing that any church does? No. We have worship, we have kids ministry, we have youth, uh, some churches do outreach, missionary, evangel. I mean, there's so many different things that any local church can do. So for us, when it comes to servanthood, in accordance to Matthew 6, 21, is for where my treasure is, my heart will be. And I think the challenge for us personally and as a local church is this. What do I value as treasure? For example, I know I used this example before, but I'll say it a little bit differently. When you buy something of your own, like a brand new car, it's yours. It's not a rental. On the rental, if uh, I once, I think, did a rental, uh, we were having a car issue, and I think I had it for like a month or so. I don't believe I ever once even brought it to a car wash. I don't, I don't believe, maybe once. Now, my own car, once a week, sometimes twice a week, because it's my own. I treasure it, I value it, I, I, I'm investing money into it. And I think this is a more of a reality check that we need to analyze our heart with, okay, is what is it that I, as a child of God, as a disciple of Christ, what is it that I'm treasuring? 
What is it that I'm valuing? If I truly treasure and value my local church, again, if I truly treasure and value my local church, that means I want to see how I can position myself to actually to add more value to it. Just as much as I value my new car, and I don't want it like a year later to have like a, a layer of Georgia clay on it because I haven't washed it. Or if you walk into my car, it's like, oh my goodness, I can count all the fast food restaurants that you've been you know, eating. You know, I got McDonald's fries in there from last year. They're already turning green and moldy. As a matter of fact, McDonald's fries have been proven. They don't, trim, they don't turn green and moldy. They'll stay in the original for, for a while. I haven't even noticed it myself. I'm like, man, what's the last time I had McDonald's? Anyway, and it's like that French fry has been there for a while. So this is a challenge for all of us. If I truly treasure my family, that means I'm going to do whatever I need to do for my family. If I truly treasure the work that I do, anything, I'm going to really put my heart to it. I'm going to really invest my time, my finances and resources. So just in this passage, the Word of God is challenging us. Like in the New Living Translation, wherever my treasure is, there the desires of my heart will be. That's why I mentioned in the beginning that tonight's lesson, it's a fun one, but it's going to be more like a spiritually speaking open heart surgery. So we can analyze ourselves. Not so I can feel guilty. Oh, I'm not doing anything in church. That's not the point. It's more of like, okay, Lord, how can I add value where you have placed me in this time, in this season? There was a time I was living geographically in another area. And there I was adding value to that local church. Then I relocated somewhere else. So wherever God positions me, it might add value in that place. Furthermore, only by understanding or discovering what is within our hearts will we be able to understand and discover what our treasure or what our treasure is? In other words, this is searching your heart. Like, okay, Lord, what is it that you put into my heart? What is it that I can actually start doing these little things that I can start implementing in my life? Uh, I know I used this example that I believe the other week. Well, I believe God is calling me, you know, to be in the stage singing, preaching. Okay, that's fine. Right now we have a need. For somebody just to stand uh, at the first impressions at the door. Are you willing just to do that? Oh, no, no, no. You know, just, just give me something bigger and better. And that, once again, is where we're able to analyze our own hearts. Furthermore, our heart is like a compass that will lead us towards our specific treasure. And as we, whether it's seen in movies, through fictional books, oh, treasure hunt, you know, here's the map, there's the big X, go find it. So that's the challenge for all of us. What is in our heart that is actually directing us specifically in a certain area that we feel very passionate about? Uh, what was it? This past Sunday, one parent uh, came to pick up their child from kids' church, and they're like, Stan, the other week was the first time I dropped off my son at kids' church. I'm like, oh, awesome, that's cool. He's like, but then you guys shocked me. I'm like, okay, what happened? I thought something went wrong. I'm like, Oops, did something go under her radar? What happened? He's like... When I dropped off my son, I'm like, man, you guys can probably call me out. I come pick him up because every parent knows their child very well. It's like, okay, this is going to give you trouble. He goes, I'm like, well, did that happen? He's like, no, it didn't. I'm like, so where's the shock part? He's like, I just blinked my eyes. And this was uh, the, the previous Sunday we had kids' church takeover. And there's my son on the stage with the hands clapping. I'm like thinking, what in the world? Is that my son? What you guys do? You know, downstairs to give him some kind of shot, some kind of kidding. So the parent was very pleasantly shocked. They saw their child in a behavior that they never expected. Not only that parent was concerned that their son is going to probably start crying and give him a fit. So I took this parent and I said, look, I said, this is why we're here. We're here not to overburden you as a mom and as a dad. We're here to actually help you out for those 90 minutes. Because during the week, you mom and dad, you're busy with the child. If you got a little one changing diapers, you're running around and all you want is, hey, here comes Sunday. And I know I'm almost guaranteed for 90 minutes, I'm just going to sit in the presence of the Lord, listen to a message, worship, and I don't have to worry about my two-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, and, and etc. And you know what? That's where we need to find treasure and value. Because what happens when we begin to position ourselves to serve others, people are going to see, wow, I'm being valued. I'm not just a number or a, or a physical body that comes here on Sundays, and that's my spot. God forbid you take my seat up there in the church, you know, that, that's where I sit. So when we are able to present ourselves to serve others, we're creating value for everyone. But that's when we choose to serve others. 
And one more point is the condition of our heart will determine what type of treasure we will attract. Uh, as I mentioned that before, we call it the first impressions team, not the first depression team. They, people don't know, wow, new life, this is what it's all about. And I've heard this plenty of times from people. The reason why I started attending such and such church is because as soon as I came through the doors, people were smiling, big sign, Jesus loves you. Wow, I already felt like at home. Or as uh, uh, Pastor Jensen would oftentimes uh, would remind uh, the people, remember, before they hear my message, they're seen and hearing your message in the parking lot. So be a good Christian in the parking lot. Because <laughs> those parking lots are big. Hey, you, you came too close to my car. Oh, you hit my car. Oh. And all of a sudden, those two get in a fight, but now they have to come to church and supposedly worship the Lord. So the condition of our heart will determine who and what we attract. And as the saying goes, you are what you eat. We've heard that many times. That is also true concerning our heart. You only attract what your heart desires or wants. So if we want to truly serve people, we will naturally begin to attract them. People are going to look forward to, I can't wait for church. Why? Because you left a good impression. I can't wait to come to Sunday because I know I can entrust my son and daughter in the kids' church. I know I can drop them off and I don't have to worry about it because someone's going to change the diaper. I know I can come to a life group and I'm going to do life together. That something's going to impact me. And that's the, uh, what we want to do on an individual basis and what we want to do as a local church. On the following page, if your heart is pure, your treasure or your inner desires will also be pure. However, if your heart is evil or wicked, your reward will also be unpleasant. Meaning that God always looks at our heart. Sometimes we wonder, why is it that I'm not uh, the principle of sowing and reaping? Why is it that I'm not reaping certain blessings in my life? That could be a lot of times a good opportunity for us to analyze our heart. With what heart am I doing what I'm doing? Oh my goodness, 10 minutes left of church. Oh, I hope these parents come right now and just take these cranky kids out of my uh, out, of, out of this room. Oh, I've had it. Oh, I'm tired. They're too noisy, they're too loud. They spilled this. I have... That's the condition of the heart. Now, is it easy to serve people and to minister to children? No, it's not. But that's where the challenge is. Why do I do what I do? Now, you may come to your job disgruntled. Oh, I can't believe I have to punch in the clock after you do this. Stuff. Okay, that's understandable. And still, we still have to come with the right heart attitude. But if, how we're going to our work in our everyday life, if we're coming to church in the same manner, trying to serve God and serve people around us, of course, the good Lord is going to look upon our heart. And the late Nelson Mandela, I've studied him. Uh, his life, his biography, very powerful individual. He said this, I stand here before you, not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. He had a, such a great inner conviction for his own people that he resisted the political apartheid, that he went to prison for more than 20 years just because he believed in the freedom of his own people. And when he made national news, International news, they try to, hey, Nelson, we'll pay you money, come out, we'll give you some kind of title. They try to bribe him. He said, no. He says, if I need to sit here in prison for the rest of my life just so my people can get freedom, then I'm going to do so. Eventually, he became free, became the first African or black uh, president of, um, in uh, South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. And obviously, became a very influential person. Why? Because... He looked in his heart and he was like, you know what? I'm willing to pay the price. And people looked up to him. And when he was free, they were willing to follow him and practically support him in everything that he did. So our Heavenly Father, our God, is very much focused upon our hearts. Uh, I had, how can I say this? We can fool each other concerning our motives, but we'll never fool God. I can put on a smile, hi, how are you? Jesus loves you. But my heart is not there. My smile is, my lips are, but my heart is just not there for different reasons. So we can put on a mask, we can deceive one another, we can lie to one another. But when it comes to our Heavenly Father, He's always looking at our heart. And then we're wondering, how come things are not changing in my life? How come I'm not receiving the blessings? How come things are a little different? Because God's like, I'm looking at your heart. 
Out of what heart are you doing what you're doing? And then trying to wrap my name around it. Well, I'm doing this for the Lord. But your heart is very, very far from there. And who can, uh, well, actually, there's one missing word here. So let me read uh, Proverbs 11.20 uh, to, to introduce or give us a little bit more clarity that our Heavenly Father, God, is very much focused upon our heart. The Lord detests, that word means hates, people with crooked hearts. But he delights in those with integrity. Next, Proverbs 17.3 says this. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And one more, Proverbs 21.2, New Living Translation. People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines the heart. So just these three Bible verses are challenging us. Look. I'm right, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, it does not matter. When our Heavenly Father looks at us, at our situation, whatever's happening, He's always looking at the heart. To lose an argument, it's, it, it's not a good feeling. To know that you have to take the path of humility, it's challenging. For you to take the higher position to say, you know what, you wrong me, Everything you said you've done against me, it hurts, but I still choose the higher path to say, you know what, I still love you, I forgive you, I release you, and I gave you a few examples within the past weeks. Now that's tough, but when we take that position, God is looking upon our hearts, okay? And just as that scripture read, people may be right in their own eyes, okay? But it's not a question of who's right or wrong, it's a position of our heart. Because you could be right in your own understanding concerning the situation, but your heart is fully, fully wrong. There's a point when, uh, when, when a woman, um, uh, the prostitute woman was washing Jesus, adulterous woman was washing Jesus' feet, and what did Judas say when she broke the alabaster flask? Who, who can remind me of the passage? What did he say? What a waste. What a waste! Now, why did he say that? Because he was a thief? He was a greedy person. He was already speaking out of that type of a hard attitude. Oh, what a waste. But then, he, but then he didn't finish there. Who can help me out? How did he conclude that? Suppose he looked so spiritual and righteous. He had to, of course, defend himself why he said that. Who remembers the scripture? Yeah, yeah we could have sold that. And we could have fed so many poor. That was lies. He was in charge of the money box, you know, people gave $100, a certain portion went into his pocket. In other words, he had the wrong heart, even though he was with Jesus. Uh, one thing I do want to challenge you guys, when you do read the Bible, it kind of bothered me uh, in the beginning. And I, I usually say from a humorous perspective, especially uh, this class having two of our own pastors, I feel a little bit of freedom to kind of take the spiritual toes with that. Can you take all of these 12 disciples that we know them by their character and nature, can you imagine having them in our church as pastors, as key pastors? That's it. That's all I'd like to say. With that said, we take a deep breath and say, Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy that we don't have no Peters that are out there getting a fight with deacons and you know trying to chop off their ears. We don't have no accountants that are taking tithes and offerings in their pocket. Or we have Deacon Thomas. Guys, we're going to reach out to Force County. Oh, only God knows. I don't think that's possible. No matter whatever the pastor would say, doubting Deacon Thomas is always doubting. We can't do it. We don't have enough money. Who else in the Bible we can compare? Talk to me. So you get the point. But when I begin to read the Bible from a different perspective, I'm like, wow, Jesus. Not only you are divine and perfect, you also are allowing us to say, you know what? Nobody's perfect. But you give chance to everyone. I mean, what, Jesus did not know who Jesus was? Of course he did. But it's for us to understand that Jesus allowed somebody like that to be in his inner circle to show us that you can be in the church. You can be in ministry. You can have a very important leadership, pastoralship title, but your heart is Miles and miles away. 
And we see that through the Bible. Jesus demonstrated that clearly through different disciples as we learn about them in our lives. So it's not for us to be judgmental of people. It's just challenging us that, you know what, just because you're talented and skilled in a certain area, that does not automatically justify you and hide your sinfulness, your bad character, your wrongful attitude in your heart that's actually not a servant heart, but it's a selfish, greedy heart. And uh, the late Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the wife of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, she said this, powerful phrase, to handle yourself, use your head. To handle others, use your heart. Powerful. Your heart is also a gateway to everything that we say and we do. And in Luke 6.45, New King James Version, we read, A good man, or woman, we understand that includes all genders, a good man, out of a good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. An evil man, out of an evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. What does that mean? That means, for, as I mentioned before, far out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So, our words, your words, will either serve as a compass and a roadmap for others, or your words will serve as a stumbling block. So, when we have the opportunity to serve and to minister others, especially when it comes to words, are we opening up opportunity for them as a compass to direct them in life, or are my words, because they're coming out of the wrong heart, they're becoming a roadblock? One more point. The fruits of your servant leadership or discipleship will eventually reveal what is in your heart. Whether you like it or not, the fruits of Judas were revealed more than three years later. At that moment, practically none of the disciples knew anything. But when the time came, they're like, wow, there's Judas. Did he truly just betray Jesus? So the fruits of your servant leadership will eventually reveal what is in your heart. What type of fruits, meaning results, what type of fruits or results are you producing in your personal life? A question and a challenge that we need to live by. Uh, something that we, uh, as much as somebody who wants to stay healthy, will go on a scale to weigh ourselves or we'll do our blood pressure or visit the doctor annually and like, oh, I want to stay healthy. This is the same challenging question is, what type of fruits or results am I producing in my personal life? Am I producing in the ministry, in my local church, or wherever I am as a leader? This is very key, very important to all of us. And who can help me read Proverbs 27, 19? Is the face is reflect the water, so the heart reflects the real person. What does that mean? People will choose to follow you because of your heart's integrity, not because of your leadership abilities. This is very important. Uh, when we first launched, um, or launched, relaunched uh, Kid Kids Church, the first month was a bit challenging, to be honest. The kids were looking at you like, who's this guy? I don't know him. If he does something wrong, says something wrong, I'm going to break out and cry. Crying, I'm going to get my mom and dad. And then, as you can see, a good portion of these kids, they were a little bit cautious, like, okay, what's this all about? We've got the flashing lights, the big screen, the program, we've got him talking, her talking. That was about the first month, month and a half. Now, kids, not only they're looking forward to seeing you because they're used to you, they want to actually sit next to you when we have a time of watching the video. You know, I'll usually sit on the floor, they sit next to me. I didn't have some kids leaning their head into my shoulder. Like I'm their father. And at first, you know, I kind of felt a little bit awkward. Like, oh my goodness, I'm not your dad, I'm not your uncle. But what I realized is when you create an atmosphere where an individual, including like a child, they feel loved, they feel accepted, they feel that they're wanted, they're going to feel relaxed. It's like, I know you're not my dad, you're not my uncle, but man, I can be around you. I feel secure. I feel loved. I feel accepted. And that's why, as the scripture says, as the face reflects on the water, okay, so the heart shows the real person. And if anyone is the most sensitive to any individual, what I realized, it's children. Or it's the younger generation. Us adults were kind of like, okay, you know, that person didn't smile to me. I'll suck it up, no problem. Maybe they had something in their eye. That's why they were kind of looking at me awkwardly. <laughs> we as an adult, we'll find an excuse to justify why somebody didn't shake our hand or say hi to us. Little kids, you can't lie to them. It's just a matter of time. Because of the innocence of their heart, it's just a matter of time 
until they're going to say, man, i got to stay away from this person, okay? Because outwardly, they're portraying a big smile, but I'm not feeling I can come close and, you know, even say hi to them. Next, following page. Uh, somebody uh, with the time, let me know when we hit about 5 of 8 so we can take a break. On the following page, with the same thought concerning that our heart is like a gateway to everything we say and do. You win people's hearts by helping them in their personal development or when you help them in their personal growth. It's amazing how much relief we as people receive as soon as somebody helps me out. Yes, sir. It should be page, uh, some of these, uh, uh, when they printed them, should be page 44. No, yeah. I missed what you said. Oh, you missed, okay. Uh, because sometimes it's like, okay. You win people's hearts by helping them with personal development. So I noticed some of these curriculums like over here, I have like a blank page. They didn't skip it, it's just a printing machine. So, let me ask this question. When you really had like a big need and somebody helped you out, how did you feel? Great. Why? What was the great feeling? Why did you feel great? Burden lifted. Okay. So you were in a position where you had a situation, a problem, a need, and you were not capable enough to resolve it. So maybe you had to go to a doctor for physical help. Maybe you had to go to a professional. Maybe you had to go to a mechanic. In other words, you had to go to somebody whom you thought might be able to help you out. And as soon as that individual or that business or phone call, whatever it is, helped you out, you're like, oh man, I just saved myself a day uh, of extra work. Or I just saved myself a thousand dollars. Or I just, I'm not going to be no longer delayed. Whatever the case may be. So as much as that's true for all of us here, that should be also the honest question that we need to ask ourselves. How can I position myself so God can use me to help someone else out? How can I position myself, it doesn't matter where, that I'm going to meet that person at the right place at the right time. For an example, uh, you've probably seen this in cartoons uh, a lot of times. In characters, they're out there debating, what should I do? And all of a sudden on one shoulder, a devil appears, on the other yeah. shoulder, an angel appears. We've all seen those type of cartoons. And the angel's like, forgive him, do good. And the little red devil like, ah, doctor, kick him and stuff like that. And usually out of humor, this little devil runs around and meets up the angel and pulls off his feathers, something like that, you know, cartoons. So we're always faced with a choice, okay? How can God use me? And one of the ways we can actually win people's heart or we can win their attention is by us positioning ourselves to do something good to them, to actually to serve them. So before you and I can offer our hand or our help as a kingdom leader or as a disciple, you must first offer your heart. And once again, this is uh, the concept of servanthood. This is a concept that we learned from Jesus that uh, works are good that we do, but a lot of times out of what heart do we do what we do? It's like, ah, oh, here you go. You don't want it. You just take it. Get out of here. And obviously that's not how God wants us uh, to do things. All right, you guys still here so far? Yeah. Yep. Any questions? Nope. About servanthood, any questions concerning uh, treasure, I have a question. Yes, please. What do you think about like, like leadership? This is the gift or this is a skill? Ooh, did everybody get that question? Now I'm going to break out on the sweat. No. The question was, is this good more of a gift or a skill? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, I'm going to take this position. I believe it's both. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody said that leaders are not born, they're made or developed. Somebody says, well, some people are already born with leadership traits, which is also true. But you can be born with specific skills and traits, but never develop them. Okay, never develop that specific muscle. It's like, does every female that is born is going to get pregnant and have a child? No, that's not true. Because throughout history, there's, I, I have an aunt, she chose a life of celibacy. So I already know one person out of who knows how many billions of females in the face of the earth who did not have a child, and she's already in her late age to have any children. Okay, so you don't have to necessarily 100% fulfill that function. So to answer that question, uh, just like anything else, you have to grow in it and you have to develop in it. Some people will grow in a certain gift much quicker. Other people, it will take a little time. For some people, you may look and say, oh my goodness, that's almost like a natural gift. Now, with that said, 
I do believe, and we're going to cover that in the next semester, my identity through Christ, my purpose, my calling, my gifting. That's going to bring a lot more clarity. I personally believe that God has endowed and deposited into our spiritual DNA specific gifts and specific qualities. Is everybody going to be a doctor? No. I hope not. Is everybody going to be a... <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> How do, you, how do you cook this chicken? <laughs> oh, all right, there you go. Dinner's ready. <laughs> is everybody going to be a pastor or a minister? No. So it does not matter what sphere. Is everybody going to be an athlete? No. Even though we can participate in them, but only a small percentage makes it to the elite level. So when it comes to our heart, I believe that's given an opportunity to everyone. An opportunity to grow. Now, some people can grow in it more. Some people a little less. And I don't believe, well, I don't want to say I don't believe. I don't think our Heavenly Father is going to twist our arms like, well, you're only your 5% or 10% capacity of where your heart needs to be. That's between you and the Lord. But I think just like anything else, when it comes to servanthood, we have to grow in that area. We have to learn how to actually exercise that spiritual muscle. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's going to come overnight. You don't just wake up in the morning, all right. I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to reach out to anyone. I'm going to go out there and help everybody. It doesn't work like that. Okay? There's some things we have to grow towards. There are some things we need to uh, receive certain knowledge, certain insight. It depends on your sphere. So did I help answer the question? Another question. Yes, please. Like, like, like Jesus is a mother of the leaders. Yeah? And he had disciples. Mm -hmm. you know, and can you be a leader without disciples? Without being a disciple? No, yeah. And without disciples around you. Okay, the short answer uh, is no. As I mentioned before, in order for you to be an influential person, as we like to use the word leader, you have to be a disciple of Christ. Now, you can have leadership skills and abilities, it's one thing, but your heart is totally not there. You're position oriented. You have a position, you have a title, you're exercising authority and power, but your heart is not there because you chose not to make Christ as the center of your life. Okay? Now, by us deciding that, hey, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, what we learn from Jesus, as we talked about in the previous lesson, Jesus, a role model, we're actually learning from him about his heart. We're learning from him about mercy, compassion, forgiveness, the power of the Holy Spirit, doing what Jesus did. And as we learn from him, because I'm a disciple. Disciple it means I'm a student. That's another term for disciple. I'm a student. If Jesus is my teacher and master, as the Bible says, oh, teacher, tell us. Even the Bible uses the word teacher. As we learn from our teacher, because I'm a student disciple, now what I've learned, I'm going out there and putting it into action, or putting my faith into action, putting word into action. And we understand that God's word has power and authority. That's where the leadership part comes in. Okay, does that help out? Yeah. Any more questions? All right, no. Do, do ask questions, do ask questions, please. Okay, the next one, the doormat principle. Uh, someone's going to be kind of smirking a little. Oh boy, here comes Neil with his principles. Uh, at our leaders retreat, I uh, shared a handful of principles. And uh, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a stenology introduction to this. Uh, the term principle uh, means it's a fundamental thing. It's almost like a rule, like a law. Okay, something that you can put into practice and will actually work. In the Bible, they're not called principles. They're called parables. And Jesus spoke a lot in parables. So Jesus took events of his time. Jesus took businesses of his time, situations of his time. Well, let's look at the farmer. Let's look at the fisherman. He throws out their, the big dragnet and they pull out of the ocean many different types of fish and then they separate them. We need this one. Then he uses goats as an example, sheep an example. In other words, Jesus, whatever time he was living in, he tried to use the resources and things that people can relate to. They're called parables, as when you stand through the Bible. Principle is a parable. So what is this doormat principle or doormat parable? It's a concept of us serving people, meaning that serving people is not easy. How many of you guys have a doormat at your house? Yep. A couple of them. Yeah. Okay. What are the basic uses of a doormat? Mostly to look pretty. <laughs> No. Sure, that's very true, especially if it's got his name on it. Just kidding. True, it's got this lovely rose on there. Wipe, wipe the shoes. Wipe the shoes. So a doormat serves a lot of uh, good uses, but 
it benefits us not as much as the doormat as soon as they wipe our feet. So, how does this doormat parable or principle apply in servant uh, in servanthood? The doormat's purpose is to have well, one of its basic purposes is to have dirty feet wiped on it before entering the house. The word usually welcome. Uh, the word welcome is usually written across the mat, just as love should be written across our hearts. Okay. Has anybody here been hurt by another person? No. Now, wives, don't be pointing at your husbands and vice versa. It's not a here to counsel class. <laughs> We've all been hurt by someone to a certain degree. When we're hurt by someone, it's almost the same thing as that person just wiped. Their filth, whatever they just did to us, upon our heart and our mind. We feel down. We feel busted and disgusted, as the sometimes the saying goes. We just don't feel good. So, when you want to be a true servant leader, be ready. People, see, when you become a servant leader, we don't deal with robots. We're not actually, uh, what's that called? Um, not, uh, it's, I got one by my house. They're, they're called pet suites. It's like a little hotel for pets. What's the name for them? Help me out here. Uh, not shelters. No, 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 no. Right, no, no, not too far from my house. People, when they go on vacation, they can actually drop it off. It's almost like a well, daycare little, for Yeah, it's like a daycare for pets. I'm going on vacation here, take care of my dog. Here's a thousand dollars, stuff like that. So in other words, as a church, we're not dealing with robots. We're not uh, dealing with someone else's pets. We're dealing with people. People come from different walks of life. People come from different attitude, from different character, different personalities, and they come with their own garbage you guys listen to me when people enter one person said it this way if you want to see the most amount of hypocrites in one moment go to any Sunday service now it's a bit straightforward but there's truth to them okay when people enter through the doors of our local church it's not just a human being dressed up nice with a smile on their face they're bringing their problems too I mean we have to be real the other day on Saturday, everything went wrong that could be wrong. But you know, Sunday's right around the corner. You have to serve the kids, you have to worship, you have to do many things. And you're like, Lord, you wake up in the morning, I need your grace today, Lord, because I'm serving. And you try to come to a church with the right heart. And God understands. We So a lot of times we think, wow, pastor, great word, oh, great song. We may, as the spectators or as people sitting in the church seats, See what's happening in the stage or we downstairs, we're thinking, oh, you guys are so awesome, serving me. But we have no idea what that person might be going through in that specific season of their life. You still with me? Yeah. We all go through life. But it's but church is not a place where we go out there, okay guys, you got 10 minutes, let me talk about all my problems that happened this week. That's not the purpose of the church. So serving leadership, this whole doormat principle is you want. Any person coming to your house, especially if you own a house, and you're the person that does a little extra mopping on the floors, you want that person, before they enter your house, to either take off their shoes or to at least wipe them off before entering. Why? Because you don't want them walking around your house with Georgia Clay. Because you're going to have to go to you know, Home Depot or wherever and get a buffing machine and start buffing the floors. I remember back in the day, I know this is primarily in the Slavic culture, and I think even also uh, in the Korean and Asian culture, right? Taking off um, the shoes, yeah. So there's a lot of cultures that practice taking off the shoes uh, at home. Yeah. And I had an American buddy back in the day come to my house. And I didn't realize that and he's walking shoes. Oh, no, no, no. I say, hey, put your shoes over there. It's like, we don't, you know, we don't walk in the house with shoes, just great extra work. It's like, oh, Stan, believe me, you don't want to smell my feet. <laughs> and I said, buddy, I said, I'd rather smell your feet than to see my wife on her force trying to wipe down all the dirt that you just brought into the house. Keep in mind, Massachusetts, winter seasons, dirt, salt. I mean, yeah. you're going to bring more than just Georgia Clay in the house. So, with that said, just as much as we want people to walk into our house with clean feet, okay, that should be our same heart posture when people come to our church and when people come into our life. Because when people come into our life, they're not going to come with clean shoes, meaning they're not going to come with a clean attitude. They're going to come in and you may, they may give you a piece of their attitude that's going to feel like they just wipe their dirty feet on you. But that's the whole concept of servanthood. Was Jesus 
a model, a great model for, for the for the doorman. It was. Yeah. People wiped away sins upon him. They cursed at him. They spit upon him. They persecuted him. But guess what? He received it because he knew his purpose. And I think that's a challenge for all of us as God's children, and especially as the local church, that as people come into our life or through those doors, whatever they wipe upon us, we receive it by grace. Say, Lord, I'm glad that at least they're in your house. I'm glad that at least we get to serve them and etc. It does not matter how many diapers they need to change, whatever, or what happens at church, I'm here to serve them. Next point, people, the missing word, point number three. People will wipe off their dirty character, as I mentioned, attitudes, and much criticism against you. Criticism is probably one of the biggest dirt that people will throw your way, especially, you know, amongst Christian folks, while we serve them. No matter what comes our way, we still serve them with a good heart. Next point, we are called to get our hands dirty as kingdom leaders or as a servants. What does that mean? If you believe that being a leader or a disciple of Christ entails sitting behind a fancy desk or wearing business attire, then you should really reconsider you know, what you do for God's kingdom. In other words, to serve people, it's not easy, but the rewards are great. We should not think, oh, I'm going to do something great for God's kingdom. Anybody here been to missionary trips? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming third world country, right? Or country that's not better off as America. I've heard people, I haven't had an opportunity to go. I've heard many testimonies of, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is people's daily lifestyle. And here I am complaining, mom, what's to eat? A lot of times you hear that from like teenagers from high school or school mission trips to poor countries. They come back home and, mom, dad, I'm sorry for always complaining there's nothing to eat. No, I, I've seen people who don't know what it means not to eat. And here I am complaining as I open up the refrigerator, the shelves are bending. I'm like, ah, what's to eat, mom? Life I had those problems with some of my teenagers, but anyway, <laughs> I gotta send them as missionaries. Yeah. Next point. It is difficult for a leader or for a disciple to bear the weight of others' anger, hatred, frustration, and personal problems. But as a result, we must maintain a positive attitude and a smile on our face at all times. As I mentioned before, human beings are human beings, and we should never take things personally. Okay? Especially when you were, uh, I, I remember this uh, situation where we were uh, talking to this uh, young lady and she was just angry and frustrated. She goes, man, these, these Christians are hypocrites. And she was a Christian herself. We're like, okay, what happened? She goes, I had this one individual come and repair my roof. They didn't do the right job. It cost me thousands of dollars. It, it continued to leak. I'm like, hey, come back here again, refix it. And then almost like three times, I had this person come out, redo everything, and I had to practically play, pay the same amount of money. And eventually got it fixed, but uh, I was just angry, upset, and, and etc. We're like, okay, well, that happens, you know? She goes, no, but that's not why I'm angry and upset. I'm like, why are you angry and upset? Because I learned that this person is also a deacon of the church. And for her, it was in a personal uh, insight that it does not matter what title you may carry in the church, it does not matter what kind of position or, or leadership you might obtain anywhere, at the end of the day, you're still a human being. But it bothered her, but you're a man of God. You know, I'm sure you preach in whatever church you go to. Aren't you supposed to be doing everything right? Supposed to be. God's children need to be separate from the children of this world. The Bible is full of such examples. But when we as God's children or his disciples, we're not exemplifying of what Jesus is teaching us, then how will the world know that we're his disciples? Who knows the Bible works? How will they know if you're my disciples? You can finish that for me. If you, if you love one another. If you love one another. If you bear fruits. In other words, God's children, we as God's children, we need to be totally different from the children of this world. In other words, not devil's children, but people who do not know God. So if I'm asked to do something, go above and beyond. The Bible says if they ask you to walk one mile, go an extra mile. Okay? They slap you on one cheek, turn around, I'll give you know, I'll give you a piece of my mind. No, that's not what it's tough. It's tough for us as God's children to hold in the single. But this is the principle of being a doormat. When you understand that your heart is positioned like the doormat, then you will not be bothered when people wipe away their uh, wipe off their attitude, 
character, bad mood, whatever. Because in return, you're like, I still love you. Come and enter. Come and enter to the church or wherever it may be. Also, being a doormat means that we are willing to bear the burdens of others while serving them with the love of Christ. The missing word is love. Love is always going to be the key thing that's going to help us out. And one more point in this uh, section. And I think we can actually... What time we got there? We can actually break. Almost. Okay, yeah. We'll finish this up and we'll take a break. Who can help me read Galatians 6, 2? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay. Uh, doesn't say become like a bear. People <laughs> give you their burdens. It says bear one another burdens. Okay. <laughs> or you understand the word give somebody a bear hug. Okay. You know. So bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. In Isaiah 53, the whole chapter 53, this is most likely uh, one of the best passages in the Bible that accurately depicts how Jesus laid down his life for us and become this type of a doormat. And it's talking, to, for those of you who know the passage, if not, go back and read it, where he was that sacrificial lamb uh, that laid down his life for all of us. You may have more seminary degrees than a thermometer, but what makes you an influential is your genuine heart for people. And we're going to conclude with this little bit of a diagram. This diagram is self-explanatory. What does it mean to have the right heart focus? On the left side, it's showing that you're self-centered. That means you're only focusing upon yourself. You're only focusing upon your needs. The spiral on the right side, how the arrow comes from inside and outward, is a little depiction of how we become people-centered. So. Make just this example or illustration of being either self-centered or people-centered challenge us because a lot of it has to do with our heart. Whatever is in my heart is going to eventually become visible before others. We may be hypocrites with a mask on our face and people will never ever guess for many years to come that we've been a hypocrite or just a liar or whatever it may be. But before our Heavenly Father, we will never lie to Him. He always looks upon our heart. All right?